Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Minnesota and Vietnam. One is a U.S. state in North America. The other is a country half a world away in Southeast Asia. Since the Vietnam War, the two places have developed an unlikely relationship. Residents of these lands have gone from fighting one another to becoming trade partners. Before the war, many Minnesotans probably didn't know Vietnam existed. But in 1962, Robert Larson became the first Minnesota casualty in the growing hostilities leading up to the Vietnam War. Larson was in a plane that was spraying Agent Orange when it was shot down by opposing forces. Larson gave his life and was among thousands of Minnesotans who fought in Vietnam during the war. Joe Doherty is the name, uh, D-O-H-E-R-T-Y, and Joe was pretty simple, it's J-O-E. I was on the farm, farming with my father, right here in Tyrone Township, Lysser County. There was no farm exemptions for that particular conflict, so um, we got our notice. I got my notice to go and kind of somewhat expecting the conflict was expanded and, and continuing, so we we went to serve. They wanted me in in like July or whatever, and I applied for extension so I could help harvest the crop that fall. A friend of mine from Lasseur was drafted the same day. We went together. So over to the courthouse and off to St. Paul to the, the, to the recruitment center and signed in there and then down to Kansas City to the transfer over to Fort uh, Leonard Wood, Missouri for basic training. It's supposed to be a six week course, and it was. We got out of there. Uh, right at Christmas time, just to get a break and um, come back. And then, of course, we reported to our next station when mine happened to be out in California. They needed me to be a uh, company clerk, so they sent me to company clerk school. You know, you just got your orders. Your orders were cut and delivered to you, and you went wherever the hell they thought fit. They decided to put together this company of uh, military intelligence on uh, the East Coast. So they shipped us over to, uh, to Fort Bragg, which is at Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina. I was a company clerk there, and we kept records and, and, all, and all the influx of materials that you take to Vietnam. We went, there was, I think there was nine of us went with the uh, Virginia National Guard, they flew us over in their C-130s, which was uh, volunteer guys flying these airplanes from the one coast to the other side of the world, and you still see those C-130s flying, which was not a fast airplane, it was a cargo airplane. It took us seven days to get there, and that was a real long story, because every, every leg seemed to have a, an issue crop up with it, you know. The airplane wasn't running all that well, and we were taxiing in to get some work done on it, and the airplane, he, they hit the hangar with the airplane. Unbelievable, yeah. So then we leave there, flying to Midway, which was, you know, just Goony Bird land out in the middle of the ocean. And, well, I was a pilot at the time and watching what was going on, because, you know, they're in the airplane, it's wide open seating. And I just like, crawl up and sit there and watch them fly the airplane, because what the hell, I hadn't a lot of other things to do. So we're getting out there and they're, they're starting to chatter a lot, a lot of conversation going on. And I, I crawled on, I said, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, we're, we're pretty low on fuel. And I said, yeah, well, we're out in the middle of the ocean. He said, yeah, yeah. And I said, we're only, it's only a couple minutes to Midway. I said, well, what's the problem? And he said, well, we got about two minutes of fuel. <laughs> Obviously we made it. But that's how close that call was. So from there, we went to the Philippines, to Clark Air Force Base. And uh, at Clark, the weather was really tough. Now we're going 
into Vietnam from there. So we take off out of there and run into a thunderstorm or weather that was unbelievable. I thought for sure it was over that day because it thrashed us around that airplane like strapped down in your, in your seat. You were still bouncing right up against the harnesses, tight. I mean, it, the cargo was shifting. It was, I at one time thought we were upside down for, you know. So we get to Vietnam and the first thing is, there was no need for me as a clerk, company clerk. So I said, well, what do, you, what do we do? And they said, well, we'll just put you over on, on, the, on the intelligence side. They need people over there. So then I got on the job training and as a military intelligence analyst on site. We worked at, the, at what was called SICV, which was part of MACV. SICV is a combined intelligence center of Vietnam. And actually, at one point, they called it the uh, Pentagon of the East. It was a, a building that housed not only the US troops, but we had the Vietnamese in there. And it was all branches of the service were all in that one building. We took in and recorded, you know, all kinds of different things, uh, sightings of operations. What we were trying to do at a longer run was put together a target for our, our troops to go get. That was the ultimate goal. There was tons of photo coming in all the time at Recce Tech. They, they were from aerial stuff and that was being viewed by specialists that, that just miles and miles of footage and try to look down and from above and see what was there. And of course, then we'd combine it with reports, on-ground reports. We had, we had some, you know, some people working out in the country that would feed information back. In my time I was there, McNamara visited. I was the guy who held the pages and turned them on the, on the charts, you know. And as he came into the room, he wanted to see the troops, you know. So I got to shake hands with McNamara and Westmoreland and of course, McNamara was a politician. Westmoreland was the military, and he was kind of, oh, I gotta do this, because he did it. He didn't really relish shaking hands with a specialist, but you know, just casual meeting of both of those two, which is maybe the highlight of my 15 months. The toughest thing possibly for me being in Vietnam was Saigon, it was, a, it was just jammed with refugees and these refugees had nothing more than being a refugee. So they were sleeping on the streets. They pulled anything over their head to keep dry at night. There was no garbage because they ate it all. When they got a pile of garbage or rubbish at the end of the street and one side a human being is going up, filtering through, and the other side are two dogs, that's, that's what you see. And that's really painful to see a country suffering like that. Then I came back and they were at the airport glad to see me and we came back to the farm and they, my mother had four brothers who were in World War II. So she knew, you know, what you needed most of all was some time to just to decompress from that kind of a place. So I came back to the farm and they were very supportive and we kind of resumed farming slowly. Well, you're quite glad to be back, obviously, but you do have a lot of bad memories and nights. You know, you, you jump out of bed and, you know, that sort of stuff. The U.S. involvement came to an end in early 1973, after the Paris Peace Accords were signed and U.S. soldiers were sent home. By July 1975, the North and South of Vietnam were unified under communist control. Vietnamese citizens who had fought against the communists were considered outcasts by their government. Many fled to the U.S., the country that had supported their cause during the war. Ờ, tôi tên là Hoa, bạn Mai tên làm ở đây tôi lấy tên Ro. Thì tôi ở Austin, Minnesota. Được 10 24, được 24 năm. Là tôi chung với làm việc chung với em tôi tên là Linh. Thì ở cái tiệm Top 10 nail này, tôi đã làm chủ ở cái tiệm này được 16 năm. À, ba tôi tê, ba tôi sinh ra thì ở miền Bắc Việt Nam. Nhưng mà được tôi nghe nói là 9 10 tuổi thì ba tôi đã đi vô trong 
Hội An ở Đà Nẵng sống được mấy năm xong rồi bắt đầu 10, 20 tuổi là đi lính cho Mỹ ở Đà Nẵng sau đó rồi năm 1966 67 thì ba tôi đi vô trong Sài Gòn rồi sinh sống ở đó rồi tiếp tục đi lính là <cười> ba tôi nói mẹ tôi sống ở ở miền Bắc Việt Nam mẹ tôi sinh năm 1938 sống cuộc sống rất là khổ mỗi mỗi ngày mỗi có chiến tranh mỗi ngày mỗi có bom phải chạy loạn mỗi ngày mỗi đêm nhiều khi phải chạy đêm chạy đêm phải chạy dậy để đi chạy loạn rồi về sau này mới, mới mới đi vô trong miền Nam để sống là hồi xưa là nghe nói có lính Pháp rồi lính cộng sản ban ban ngày á thì Pháp còn ban đêm là cộng sản về sau mới mua vô trong Sài Gòn để vô trong Nam để sống Tháng 4 năm 1975, 28 tháng 4 năm 1975, ba tôi bị bắt làm tù binh ở tại Long Thành. Rồi ba tháng sau, gia đình mới biết tin là ba tôi đã bị bắt, rồi bị đi học tập cải tạo ở trại cải tạo Long Khánh. Tại vì ba tôi đã bị đi học tập cải tạo, sau mày sau cái ba năm cải tạo. Dạ, ba thi nó sống ở trong khi mà ở trong tù học tập cải tạo rất là khổ cuộc sống rất là khổ ăn uống không đầy đủ thì sau sau khi mà ba tôi ra tù thì cũng có mấy cái bệnh về khi mà ở trong tù bị đi lao động hợp tác một năm sau đó thì Nhà nước Mỹ đã có cái lệnh là cho những người tù binh của Mỹ đã học tập cải tạo bên đó là được đi qua bên Mỹ sinh sống. Rồi gia đình tôi làm giấy tờ để được đi. Ba má tôi với lại năm anh chị em tôi đi. Tôi ở qua bên Mỹ sống ở bên Cali ở bên California được 3 tháng xong rồi ba tôi có người bạn sống ở Minnesota, Austin Minnesota này nói ở đây sống À, cuộc sống à, dễ sống với lại không có phải nói tiếng Mỹ nhiều rồi từ từ mới đi học sau rồi có cái hãng nó nhận làm làm thì làm được 5 năm sau đó tôi đi học à, tiếng Anh vừa học vừa vừa đi làm vừa đi học tiếng Anh thì sau đó tôi biết được ít tiếng Anh rồi tôi mới đi học à, nghề làm neo thì nghề làm neo thì học thì nó dễ hơn nó không có cần nhiều tiếng bởi vậy tôi mới đi học để học được một năm thì tôi đi đi học cái bằng manager xong thì tôi mở cái tiệm là bây giờ gọi là top ten nail tôi đã làm được 16 năm nay giá dạ, Việt Nam Việt Nam bây giờ về rất là đẹp tại vì cái lúc tôi ở đó là mới xong chiến tranh bởi vậy còn nhiều cái chưa có được nhưng mà bây giờ có nhiều nước vô đầu tư bởi vì Việt Nam bây giờ rất là đẹp đó là em tôi tên là Linh là tôi đã làm chung với em tôi được 16 năm nay làm ở cái tiệm này 16 năm. Ồ, tôi, tôi gọi cho em tôi người em tôi cũng sống ở bên này nhưng mà có về bên Việt Nam để làm ăn. Bởi vậy mỗi mỗi ngày tuần lễ tôi nói chuyện với em tôi một lần ở trên cái FaceTime. Dạ, 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 bây giờ thì cuộc sống gia đình của tôi rất là ổn định. À, rất là ổn định à, Tôi có người em cũng làm chủ tiệm nail rồi Gia đình tôi làm chủ tiệm nail này luôn Rồi anh tôi đi làm thì rất là ổn định Cuộc sống rất là thoải mái Since the mid-1980s, Vietnam has encouraged trade with other countries In 1995, relations were normalized between Vietnam and the U.S. Today, America is Vietnam's second largest trading partner. Hello, my name is Gabrielle Jarbo and I'm the executive director for the Minnesota Trade Office and the chief protocol officer of the state. Vietnam uh, is in the ASEAN region, is one of the fastest growing regions in the world right now. The middle class is growing at a pace that is incredible. Uh, just to give you an idea, last year their FDI foreign direct investment grew 40% just in one year. That means companies 
in the region or outside of the region decided and chose Vietnam as the best place to set operations and start either producing or developing product. The biggest outside of Korea manufacturing from Samsung, Samsung is in Vietnam. They have chosen Vietnam as the place to manufacture. The relationship uh, between the United States in general and Vietnam is strong and, uh, and with high expectations for the future. The relationship is always very tainted by history, unfortunately. However, um, with the new generations coming, there is a lot of opportunities getting uh, into Vietnam and doing good business with Vietnam. Uh, from the Minnesota perspective, in 10 years, Vietnam went from 47 in our list of partners that we export by importance and by millions of dollars to 28. It increased 270% in 10 years. Um, last year we exported around 100 million dollars of goods, already manufactured goods. So on a yearly basis normally we've seen Vietnam grow at 22 percent, like from 2016 to 2017, our trade grew 22 percent. Not only because the products that we export are, again, vehicles, are medical devices, pharma, machinery, printers, spraying machines, optics, surgical instruments, uh, analytical instruments, artificial body parts. That is 2.6 million, which is around 7%. But the imports are 135, 145 million dollars. So we import also vehicles, electrical machinery, furniture, bedding, footwear. Footwear is a huge product that we, we import from Vietnam. Vietnam is a huge manufacturing country and is also a huge agricultural mm -hmm. country. We are a huge agricultural state and we are a huge manufacturing state. To give you an idea, the agricultural um, workforce is 41% of the whole workforce and manufacturing is 18%. Still very agricultural. I think Minnesotans will be surprised to know that Vietnam is one of the major global suppliers of coffee. There was a little bit after the Vietnam War, there is kind of a... I think that everybody was healing, if I tell you the truth. And I can see it from countries, you know, if you're a member of a country that has been in a major war, that has cost you a lot of citizens, there is always a period of, okay, everybody, take a deep breath and let's just heal, because you need to heal. The strengths of, uh, of Vietnam, if you look at them right now, and for Minnesota, how do we see it and what do we see in it, is that First of all, they are amongst one of the fastest growing economy of the ASEAN region. There's a young demographic right now coming. Young demographic that they're much more prepared than before. You know, we have technology and thanks to technology, well, information is much more available. So now you're getting into a younger demographic that will push to make sure that they become more competitive. One of the sectors that uh, it is very, very visible in, in the Twin Cities and Minnesota is the restaurants and all the hospitality industry. Typical, very traditional uh, restaurants that again, they're businesses for the full family. They're businesses that really uh, make those families able to learn a livelihood and, uh, and they're just sharing their culture because at the end of the day, food is another cultural aspect. I am Olga Ruvekamp and I am the Executive Director of Minnesota Agriculture and Rural Leadership, MARL. So MARL, Minnesota Ag and Rural Leadership, is a 18-month uh, cohort leadership program for leaders in agriculture and, and rural areas, professionals in those fields in Minnesota from all across the state, men and women, different generations who all have a career in either agriculture so farmers or uh, agribusiness, agencies, uh, you name it. We always have one international agricultural study trip with each class of MARL. Vietnam uh, really stood out, uh, first of all, because of the connections that we have with Minnesota agriculture in Vietnam. Um, a lot of our soybeans, for instance, get exported to Vietnam. But another reason is also to look at different commodities, how do, uh, you know, different crops. How do you grow coffee? How do you grow pineapple? And what do farmers in other 
pieces of the uh, parts of the world, how, what do they face? And how does that work in a communist system? Because Vietnam is a communist system. So our members of the uh, moral class eight uh, went on the trip. People look forward to uh, the exotic parts or history. And some of that very ancient history, uh, the Buddhism, the temples, uh, the, all of those things. And then the food, people like to try different foods. I was very surprised with the kindness and the friendliness of the people. We traveled throughout the country. So we started in the north in Hanoi, which was really the source of the communist system. And so um, Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City nowadays is in the far south. And we, so we traveled gradually south. And so you can see that divide. And we did notice some of that, um, some of that perspective change and become more progressive, more westernized as we move farther south but I have to say they were very friendly in the north too planting rice we could actually uh, you know, take off your shoes and socks and, and go into that wet field and and plant some rice ourselves so that was a highlight our, our pig people they they really like to stop at a, a pig farm the beauty of a certain pig or boar is apparently something that they look at differently. And so they were tattooing like, a beautiful flowery tattoo on a big pig, which was new to me. <laughs> so, so that I think was a highlight. To, to me, the perspective building comes first and then connecting the dots. So um, why do things work the way they do? Why does Vietnam have a communist system? And why, you know, what has happened in history? And how does it all work out today? And, and so that makes us better trade partners at the end of the day too. A group of Minnesota farmers went to Vietnam as part of a trade visit to learn more about the destination of the fruits of their labor. The group that we went with was the Minnesota Soybean Research and, and uh, Promotion Council. Uh, what they call it is a, a see for yourself tour. And we, we go over, we went there to see where our product was going and how it was being used. And along the way we were promoting it as well. We went to North, to Hanoi, uh, and uh, there we found a couple of big importers. And then of course we went to some sites where that was consumed. Uh, uh, hog operation, chicken operation, um, even down in the Mekong to later on to see where the fish were fed. And of course along the way you you meet the attaches and the USEC folks that are over there that are representing us on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the reasons I was looking for that type of, op of an opportunity was to get back and see if, I, if my thoughts weren't correct that Vietnam would be better off without us and I think we found that, I found that. I found a sort of vindication and a, I don't know, a closure, if you will, to the whole situation. Well, I went there 50 years after I'd served over there, uh, to, and I found Vietnam to be a very vibrant country. Um, you don't have freedom of ownership of properties, et cetera, but people were productive, people were energetic, uh, their commerce was flowing, and uh, if you look at Saigon today compared to 50 years ago, it's, it's thriving. It was what I wanted to, to do and see. I didn't care to go where some old bomb crater was. I wanted to see what the Vietnamese people were like today. There's, a, there's a sub, a, quite a difference, if you will, if, between North Vietnam, if you're on the street talking to people, it's more subdued. Um, and I kind of compare that, that's Beijing, if you will, because that's where the rules are made and the, and the government are up there. And down in Saigon is where the money is made. And it's just a high freewheeling that reminds you of Malaysia or somewhere, Singapore. The ports are busy, the country's alive. So, and you can see that, but you know, it's, it is 1,100 miles between those two cities. So it's a very long, narrow country down to 
27 miles wide in the narrowest right on the DMZ area. We went out of there and we kind of swung over the city of Saigon. I, it was an open, clear day, 50 years ago. And, and we flew north up along the coastline, off the coast. And as we were leaving, I'm looking back, I said, you know, that is one beautiful country. It's just unfortunate that it's a, a war zone at this time. And almost the same way this year, when I got, had the CD, went right up the countryside in the same beautiful country it was back then, only it's at least somewhat at peace. Minnesota and Vietnam have traveled down an unlikely road together. Vietnam has gone from a battleground to a trading partner in a few generations. Eventually, the dust stirred up by marching feet and bullets settled. There was a time for healing and a time for progress. Vietnam once again opened its doors to the West, not as a combat zone, but as a place where trade and commerce is valued. Business and agriculture from Minnesota have flourished by their association with Vietnam. The future is bright for these two societies, as long as their good relationship is maintained. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.